And then this, that's what I'm talking about. And one of the things that you see, you've got your eight nails on each side, don't you? Notice how this plate actually drops down because this is actually covering two codes. It's covering the tie for the overmatched plate, but the code also requires in the plumbing and the mechanical section for this plate to drop down two inches for what purpose? Yeah, when you put like uh, molding up, crown mold, you know, pop that thing, you know, knock a pipe or something and then get a leak in a wall or electrical wire or something like that. So that's what that's for. That's the mechanical too? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, because you got AC lights. Yeah. So. It's going to be hard to drive a drywall through Yeah. With that thing? Yeah. So before I go on, what's your question, Gary? There's an exception to that. Where you, sh where you sheath the whole, the wall? The wall, continuous structural sheathing, I think it says. Yeah. I, I'm try, I haven't looked at that code in so long. Who's got their code book here? Anybody got their code book? Uh, would you look up in chapter 6, would you look up 60, uh, 602, what is it, 602, 6, it's probably 6-1. Six, yeah. What it'll do is it's talking about the overnotch top plate. Really the top plate. Yeah, there's an exception. Okay. Um, when the entire side of the wall with the notch or cut is covered by wood, structural panel sheathing. So if you're going to notch that too much, you better do it on the outside if you're using an OSP. If you've done it on the inside, then you gotta do the whole wall there. It's a lot cheaper to put a strap in. Exactly. Okay. I had forgotten about that code. But I, 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 can't, I, guess a, I guess there's some time when you would have to stack the one up from the outside or something. I don't know. Somebody might have cut it out there before they finished sheathing it. Okay. It's usually though, I mean, the framers are out doing most of their stuff anyway before the, you know, all the trades come in and do their work. Um, girders and header spans. Uh, what's the difference between a girder and a header? Nothing. They're collecting loads and transferring it to each side of an opening, right? They're the same thing. That's why they were combined in tables in Chapter 5, which is actually the floor. So you're getting a kind of a floor situation with a girder, but also it's for a door or a window, a header as well. So they're the same thing. Yeah, Chris? I was going to mention to you, they, they, there's one builder in town who, a lot of them have a lot of copper stolen, but they were trying to alleviate the copper being stolen, so they were try, trying to run a chase through the exterior wall, uh, the pipe, the PVC pipe through the exterior wall, so to run the line set for the air conditioner, but the wall wasn't thick enough. <laughs> you have to go to a wall to get it thick enough to put the line set up through the three inch pipe. So it would work. Oh, interesting. They tried okay. it. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's a big problem in, in town. Are you in, are you in Atlanta All now? Over. Are, you, are you Fulton or Atlanta? Rob Legward. What, what, oh, so you Fulton County still? Yeah, yeah we okay. go to Worth. Okay. But I'm just saying, but you're Fulton County. Well, there's no Fulton County. Oh, it's gone? It's called City of Fowl Fulton for right now. Oh, got it. But okay. it's, it's changing. But we're all over. Nova's all I work for Nova. Nova's all over. Okay. So you're a private company then? Yeah. Oh, okay. So there's a table that has exterior bearing walls. So a header or a girder on exterior bearing wall. Yeah, I'm going to show you a table, but what we're going to be looking at the table, what's the support condition? What is that header or girder supporting? We have lumber sizes to choose from. Is it two 2x6s, two 2x8s, two 2x10s, by two by three of them, four of them? And then we look for what the span limit between the, the jack studs is. Okay, that's how you use the table. Okay, and Instead of going and looking at the list, I'm just going to graphically illustrate. One support condition is where that header or girder is supporting a roof or a ceiling. You got rafter and ceiling loads on it. Okay, that's one support condition. Second one would be you'd have the roof and ceiling and you'd pick up a floor load, but that floor has a center bearing on it. So far, are we all good? 
And then a third would be that roof ceiling and a clear span floor. So which is going to have more weight on the head of this condition or this? The third one, because you've got a tributary load from half the house coming over here. You've only got it from here over, because the other half's going to that center. Okay? We all with me? Okay, and then this condition, roof ceiling, and you got two bearing walls that are center bearing. And then finally, roof ceiling and two clear spins. So this right here is going to probably, the, if you use the same lumber here to here, this is going to have a shorter span than that. Everybody got that? Because there's more weight on this for the same material. If I was using two 2 by 6s for my header, I could span more here than I could here because there's a lot more weight on it. So I've got to shorten my distance. Everybody clear? Okay. And there's also a condition. The table has the assumption that you're dealing with a gable house. So it really is difficult to apply to a hip roof house or something that you don't know the orientation of the floor. So the building width is that you're perpendicular to where all that bearing is. So in this case, let's say this is front to back. Because the reason is, is the spans are based on the tributary loading. Okay, that's what the numbers are based on. So here's a condition. I've got the worst case condition in this. You've got your ground snow load. They just try to make this universal. We don't have a snow load in Georgia. We use 20 pound, so we use the 30 pound column. Okay, so really, if somebody's an inch or two off, it's probably, they're probably okay, because we're dealing with a 30 pound load here, and we only are required to have a 20 pound load in Georgia for our roofs, okay? Um, so if you have the roof ceiling, two clear floor spans, remember that building width? You're given 20, 28, and 36. So they're doing it because if you know you have 36 feet from front to back, the tributary load on a clear span would be 18. If you had a center bearing, it would be 9. So that's how this map is all done to determine how far these things can span. The other thing is, is that you've got, I'm just choosing that there, and there's your span. So if I was using two 2 by 10s at 36, I could go all the way up to 3 feet 8 inches. You know, if I beefed it up and went to 4, four 2 by 8s, I could go all the way up to 5 3. The thing that you want to also know about this table is the NJ column. That's the number of jack studs on each side, okay? Some cases you might be required to have three jack studs on each side, which that's very common. I, I have a picture I was gonna throw in there, I took it out, but I have a picture of Jim. We, were done, we had done a field trip about four or five years ago, and you're standing there, we're counting, and we had a thing where there was two, but there was required to be three, and so, I took a Russell picture, it was all blurry, so I just took it out. <laughs> and then there is an interior one. See, the interior one, is an interior wall going to have more load or less load than the exterior? Under the same condition. Under the same conditions. So you got one floor only and two floor only. Remember, you've got to load this way and this way. So you've actually got, instead of the tributary load only going here, you've got here and here. So you sometimes may have a condition where it might be more, okay? And then this is the wrong thing in here, so I'm not going to go over it. But anyway, so headers and girders, we look for all kinds of stuff. This is saving the planet one header at a time. <laughs> No tree huggers in here? Okay. <laughs> and then HVAC guys hate wood, right? He hates cans. Brand new house, Bridge Mill. I can remember this, yeah. Huh? Pl plumbers hate it too. Water heaters, two water heaters. Yes, sir. Two questions. How do you fix that with the HVAC duct? It's not up to us. See, that's the beauty of what we do. I mean, I, you get yourself in trouble when you start getting down that road. 
and it's not your job to do the research on it. Yeah, go ahead. Second question, how long does it normally take just on average for you to do a pre-drywall inspection? Yeah, it's going to depend on the size of the house. I tend to be a little bit, spend a little bit more time. I'm slower. I mean, there's certain guys, I mean, and I'm not trying to be funny about this, but Alex's brain works faster than mine, and that's just a reality. I mean, so I just go slower and I process things. So it, I would answer that question by saying a typical time might be between three hours to five hours, depending on size, but it's also depending on the complexity <coughs> of an issue. And it's my comfort level that I want to keep walking because I will say the longer I'm at a house, sometimes I'll walk by and go, crap, I never saw that before. And so, I mean, it, there really is a, a correlation between the longer you're there, the more you're probably going to find. So, but I think, isn't that pretty much everybody's average here? Um, three to five? It takes as long to do a pre drywall as it does to go uh, on an existing home and do a home inspection. Except if it's an old house in Atlanta with a crawl space. <laughs> <laughs> but that is, that's for Robert. Okay, in, in reference to my homework assignment. Yes, sir. It seems to me, from what I was able to look up, that if you see a condition that the stud is that much overcut, yeah. that it clearly violates the notching and the hole standard, you, you should really ask them for the structural data on that stud shoe and what is it rated to hold. Can it take the load that the stud would ordinarily take? Right. That's really the only answer you can give. Yeah, and that's what you did. And I was just curious if the manufacturer said they had a limit, basically saying they didn't at all in there. But the thing is, you don't know what load's coming down the stud. True enough. Good so point. You just pass it on. Well, and that's a, and again, I think you're absolutely that. That'll agree a thousand percent with you because again, we just don't know. You know, we're just seeing that some, there's a some type of incongruity between what should be and what is not, and so we don't know how. So put your yeah. Exactly. I mean, they really butcher some yeah. of these things. Uh, and it would be just as easy to just put a stud in. Give you know. credit. <laughs> I had a quick question. Yeah. Right here. Yeah, you give them half credit. Jump in. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty new to this, and I'm kind of beginning to realize I've still got a lot more to learn. Yeah. Uh, we're going through like the notches and, you know, the run plumbing and all this stuff do, but I guess we can't have anything in the Is that correct? Like a knot correct. of holes? Correct. You're not okay. supposed to. They're not designed for it. So there's, because, and you're, that's a great question, because there is no provision for notching or putting holes through there. If you see one, it sh probably shouldn't be there. Gotcha. Thank you. Huh? So sometimes it's just the simple stuff that I walked by this, you know, six times before it was like, oh, Where's my stud? You know, stuff like that. Or also look at things like stud spacing. You know, two by six in a basement with two stories, 16 on center, not 24 on center. So you've overdone it. Chris? Simpson says two and three eighths max. Oh, they actually have something. Yeah, look at that. I'll use it. Well, Robert doesn't have that technology. He's, he's, he's got a can and a string. Give me a But you remember the remember know your know your stud spacing table depending on the load there. And then sometimes things are just silly. This is a closet under a stair, and they tack everything on on the slats on the bottom of the stair. Come on now. And the whole thing rattled. <laughs> Um, sometimes we got to remember again we're ever we're all in the structure and gravity and all that kind of stuff right that's for you Mike I'm kind of doing your invitation <laughs> but uh, what are non-structural issues you see this right here this is a basement below grade right here that's right if you are in contact with a concrete or block wall below grade with this wood, it has to be pressure treated. So look for stuff like that. Okay. <coughs> Correct. They yes, sir. One other thing is for that homeowner, if they're going to finish that space, they need to have a vapor barrier between that concrete and the finished material to stop mold from growing on the backside of that drywall. 
The best thing that you can do is build this wall out, right. <laughs> get it far enough away. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and but if they do that, see, it's, I'm, it's the same thing that I was telling these guys, Bill. If they did it right, then you would I'd have be, no business. Yeah, I'd be doing something else. Exactly. <laughs> what would you say is the safe distance to bring it out so it's not touching? Well, it, all the code just says is contact. It doesn't give us it doesn't give us millimeters or anything like that. It just says contact. So that's all we can do. You know, one of the things that there is a precision in the code, but there's also a vagueness. So you know, you just got to kind of get used to it. <coughs> um, wall bracing. I think I'm going to give you a 10 minute break. And I'm just going to start. So if I get started when, in 10 minutes, if you're not here, you lose. Bus is leaving, you ain't on it, you ain't going. <laughs> All right, so this is a critical. I think you really want to be paying attention for this because this is some of the stuff that you're going to see a lot of. So wall bracing. Many times the house wrap is already installed on the house. So it's very difficult for you to do a thorough wall bracing inspection on a house. Okay? Uh, sometimes you'll catch it when it's not, but in most cases that builder wants to wrap that place and protect it. Okay? So really wall bracing is really too complex for most mortals, wouldn't you say? Yeah. All right. Who is this? Matt. So any young guys don't know who this is? You've missed out. <laughs> We have warp minds because of it. Uh, I want to bring this to your attention. This is a really, really good publication. You can buy the electronic version and cut, copy, and paste some of the diagrams. This is a guide to the 2012 IRC wall, wood wall uh, bracing provision. APA pretty much put this together, but you buy it from the IACC. Um, if you are an ICC member, it's for the book. It's up 35 bucks. I think it's um, you know just a little bit more for electronic, or about the same. But again, I, I usually just get most stuff electronic, and then I have, don't have to scan it. Um, this thing right here, um, for those of you who are new, you really need to join the ICC. It's what is it, 150 bucks now? Yeah. A year. Yeah. It's a hundred. Is that all it is? Depends upon what level you join. Okay. What is it? One seventy-nine for most of us. I paid one fifty. Well, it's gone up. Really? Really? Okay. So I'm gonna. I gotta re up in August. So I'm gonna pay more. So anyway, what what you get for a membership? you when you first initially join, you will get a free code book. Get your 2012 IRC. You'll get it free. So you know, that can cost usually about a hundred bucks anyway. So you're already getting your money back and then you get discounts uh, on anything you buy. So it can pay for itself, especially if you're ramping up right away for your first year. So, but this is the resource that you want to have that will tell you probably more than you need to know about wall bracing. Um, we want to talk about walls and diaphragm systems. You are using the sheathing on a house whether it's your decking, see you think of the roof decking just to hold the shingles, right? Is that what it's for? Yes. But what's also for? It's also to join all the rafters together to stiffen that as a diaphragm. And then when you put OSB or other different sheathings on a house, you're tying the top plates, the studs, and the bottom plate and helping that wall resist racking. So you're stiffening it up and it helps when it pulls either seismic or wind loads to grab those loads and drop them down to the foundation. That's the purpose of this. So it's acting as a system. So they actually can call a roof <coughs> diagram transferred loads to the walls, and they call that a deep beam because it's acting like a beam, okay? And the walls then transfer those loads to the foundation. So, you know, you essentially have what we call a lateral load path from wind. Okay, you get wind blowing on a house. This is almost like the sail of a sailboat. You know, you got a lot of collection going on right here. But if you built your walls and your roof right, and you know, you got push force this way is going to be resisted from the roof and the walls there. 
It's going to collect those loads, okay, and then it's going to transfer that because you'll also get suction on this end as well. It's going to transfer it eventually to the ground. So that's essentially the purpose of your bracing, okay? And it's a very simplified presentation, but that's what it's doing. So that's why, again, you're tying all the framing members so they work as a system, okay? Um, this is a picture that's in the, um, the IRC that's showing you something called braced wall lines. That's merely a section of a wall that has to be braced. Um, when I first, I think I came in the 95 Cabo, what we have about six codes there for wall bracing? Now we got pages. Um, there's a lot to learn. They've kind of modified it because and a lot of the data from this came from actual testing. They laboratory and uh, tested these assemblies and they were tested for both earthquakes and for wind. So that's why you're going to see different tables and different adjustment factors in there. And I don't want to get too in depth. I mean, I, I believe I could probably do a two day class on wall bracing. There's that much stuff in there that would apply to this area. If there's that much stuff that's in there. But I really don't want to get that deep into it. I want to think about what we can do most times. Again, that house wraps on the house. Probably the best thing that you can do is check your fastening schedule for outside panels. Because what is the minimum number of fasteners on the edges? Or the spacing requirement? Yeah, you can't be any more than six inches on there. And in the field, 12 inches. So that's probably the one thing that you can do uh, a lot of times before the house wraps on there. Um, but you have what are called qualifying panels and it kind of can be complex because even though you might have a wall line, but you might have something that divides it up. So you create braced wall lines from here to here and then here to here and then you count qualifying panels and if you got a door or a window and all these things, it becomes very, very complex, okay? But I just wanted to give you the the term is braced wall lines. That's merely the length of a wall is a braced wall is a wall line, and you put braces in there. Now, what we mostly see in this area is most of the houses we uh, look at are OSB, right? They fully sheathed. They are, it's called continuously sheathed. That's the term that is used in the code book. When we were dealing with the Florida hurricanes around 2003 and four the price of OSB went really high. Also, you had things like uh, Earthcraft, <coughs> who were giving you a point system for an Earthcraft energy efficient house, so you saw a lot of foam panels. Well, OSB is a lot cheaper than those foam panels, so you're, that's why you've seen more and more builders go to it. OSB is a probably one of the best materials to stiff in the walls of the other bracing methods that are available. So that's why a lot of builders use it and everything. Um, again, it's multiple steps, and, but it's very close detailing of a wall line. Um, we're going to get into something in a minute, but I want to just point something out to you so that you're aware of it, especially as a builder. Okay, we got a couple builders in here. I don't know if you guys knew that, but there's we've got some spies here. So <laughs> now they're our friends. Remember, we're all working together. So sometimes I've had scenarios where, like, this might be a garage. And then you got a wall, and then so we got a braced wall line over here, okay? And we might have three windows here, and then we got a door, and then we got a short section of wall. You don't have enough space to put a qualifying panel. When I say qualifying panel, there's a minimum width of these things, and that's side to side. You can um, also create like a garage opening here. If you got those three windows. You can, if you build it like the garage wall detail, you're allowed to have two what they call portal frames per wall side. So that can be addressed and you can have narrow panels on each side of those openings by creating a portal frame. So just because somebody doesn't have, oh that, they don't have enough room there, check in the inside because if they've done a detailing like the garage wall, then they've qualified and they've stiffened that area. So. Um, just letting you know that there are other ways to do this. Um, but again, wall, walls and windows and doors can be a challenge, especially because you're trying to keep that wall from moving and you've got an opening or you've perforated it. Um, and then this is just a picture just showing you some real basics that you can, you've got to start a
panel, this is assuming you are not continuously sheathing the house. You have to start a qualifying panel within 10 feet of the ends. And you can't have any greater distance from edge to edge than, edge to edge than 20 feet. So those are some of the things that you look at. But again, in reality, I, I do know a lot about wall bracing, and I've probably forgot a lot already of it, but the reason I forgot is because I rarely ever use it out in the field. It's just, again, something that it doesn't come up because we don't see it that much. Uh, I just wanted to make you aware of it, that it's out there. Um, also wanted to make you aware of the bracing methods, leaded bracing. You know, do you guys ever see that much anymore? Huh? Yeah, even with metal. Yeah, rarely. Most of the time, you're going to see this right here. Uh, oops, actually. Daniel, couldn't you use lead in bracing, though? Uh, if you have a for the fact that the OSB's not I don't know, because this is not assuming you're using them in combination. This is assuming you're using them exclusively. So this is all I have to work with. I mean, an engineer would have to do that determination. But this is primarily what we're using. And by the way, be aware that all those values are also based on using 3 8 inch thick material. We use 7 16 inch. So in reality, even if there are narrower walls, um, we probably have stiffer walls than this is the baseline. It's a 3 8 inch. Okay? So just be aware of it. The only other thing that we sometimes see is structural fiberboard. Okay? So there's a section on that. The one thing I'll point out is, is that nailing pattern is three inches, every three inches on the edges and six inches on the field. I think there's like something like 100 and something, 160 something faster per board. Um, but I'm going to talk about the ICC has an equivalency product for structural fiber board. I'm going to address it. It's that sturdy board. And I'm going to address it because it's, it's still out there. There's a couple of national builders that are building here and it's there's a lot of problems with the way they're doing it. So I'm going to show you. Huh? Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to deal with it. I'm, I'm coming to it, okay? But I'm going to come in, I'm going to use it for the garage wall because I'm really going to focus here. So that's where I wanted to go. This is another uh, section of the table. And you're seeing up here, this is when you're doing intermediate bracing, where you're just doing bracing at certain intervals and they have them up here, we don't really deal with that. We're gonna be down here where we get continuous sheathing. Now, the first thing that you might see is you see continuously sheathed wood structural panel uh, for garages and stuff like that. And that's what we think, oh, that's the one that we use in Georgia. No, you don't, because all the design values are based on 3 8 inch. We don't wanna use that because this, this narrowest panel that you can use for that is 24 inches. I'm gonna show you that in a minute. We actually should be using this one. Oh, I, should, I thought I had it here. The CSPF, and I'm going to I'm going to go back to it because see that number right there, seven sixteenths. That's where all the design values are based on. That's what we're using here. So we're going to be using the CS-PF method. It means continuously sheathed portal frame. Okay, and that's what we'll spend some time with. I wanted to just touch base with this real briefly. There's a section in the IRC that makes it real simple to do your wall bracing calculations. And they even made it simpler because the APA made it even clearer. Uh, the Georgia Amendments actually adopted this for Georgia. You can actually use this. It's a real simplified thing in the Georgia Amendment. You can download this for free. Again, just go to the Georgia Amendment and then you can see where to get this, okay? Real simple. But what it does, it's very, we have, a, it's close to what's in the code. There's just a few other things. You've got to use 7 16 which we already do. It can use it into up to 100 mile an hour zones. We're in 90, so we're good. And it, uh, it helps you when you're dealing with non-rectangular designs and buildings. And I'll show you why. Because what you do is, if I have a building with all these offsets and bays and shapes like that, you go to the furthest edges and draw a rectangle around it. And then the table will say, if you're doing, because again, the assumption is you're putting OSB around the whole house. And because that's the most superior method of bracing, and you're using 7 16 they're going to tell you how many panels you need for every wall. 
it's real simple. Two panels, three. So, and what that means is I may have doors and windows, so I only have two full panels on that wall. And if that's all it's calling for, simple. So that's what makes it easy. But the one thing that you want to know about this, this only applies to two stories. If, it, if you got a two story with a basement, it doesn't apply anymore. It's come two up, comes two up out of the ground, now you're more subject to movement from wind. So it's so that's why. So it's a, limited to two stories. Okay, but you really need to know this because it's a real simple way of doing it and you might be asked the question. Um, and Robert, that's not circumcised, okay? Just to let you know. I know you're going there. Yeah, Bill. Question for you, uh, implying, you know this, work with me on the stucco homes, a lot of times the hard coats and all just you have an insulator board on the field studs. There's only bracing on the corners. Good point. Okay, so you're not complying with fully qualified sheathing. What Bill's saying is that sometimes on a lot of uh, hard coat stucco applications, they're only using OSB on corners and intervals, so they're intermediate bracing because they're using an insulator board as the fillet material in between to apply the the uh, screen on there. The screen the on the coats can go over open framing. They don't even have to have a Well, do you know that, Bill knows this, but do you guys know that hard coat stucco is actually a method of wall bracing? You have to fasten the um, mesh on there at specific intervals, but it's in that column there. So it is a wall bracing method because it does stiffen the wall up. I don't know, based on what we see at Bill, though, I don't really want to rely that on for a wind bracing. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, though. Is a lot of those homes, and even non stucco homes, have sheathing on the corners, but insulator board or fiber board on the field stuff. Absolutely. That's a great point. I forget that because I'm so used to just seeing all that, but, you know, somebody can say, you know, because they're doing it also for the value of the insulation mm -hmm. by putting that insulator board. So, okay. Well, you're right because I remember, you know, how we... I, I've worked for Bill doing stucco and mold inspections before, and we've gone down, especially on the south side, we've gone, and we'll go into an attic and we'll look down the wall and we'll catch its insulator board, not OSB. Yeah, and say the Eats, they use gypsum board as a sheet. Right, yeah. right. So, am I wrong, Mike? <laughs> okay, so what I want to really do is deal with where you're going to find the most consistent code violations, and that's garage openings. That's where you're going to find them. That's where I think you can really give value to your client and the builders by finding this stuff, okay? And it's the most practical to evaluate. It really is, okay? You got this uh, steel, this thing from uh, one corner of the garage all the way to the across the garage opening, and then I have a continuous. Uh, that uh, <coughs> for the uh, narrow wall You talk about the header? Yeah. Yeah, we're getting there. Okay. We're getting there. We're going to get into the de detail right here. Right yeah. yeah, I'm going to get into it. So, Bob, is this what you were looking for? Yeah. yeah. Bob, is this the picture you were looking for? Notice this figure that's in Chapter 6 of the code. 602.10.6.4 method CSPF. You don't want to use the, the, the G one, you use this one. This is the one that you will use that applies to our Georgia construction here, okay? And what I would say to you guys is, because it's a picture, it's easy to look at, and if you study this, you will usually find violations of this out in the field. I don't think that I've rarely ever not found something. I see you shaking your head there, John Mark. No. I mean, it's almost, there's always something that you're going to find. And all you got to do is study this thing, and it really isn't as big. I know some of you might be looking for the first time. There's not a lot on this picture, I'm telling you. So it's pretty easy to do. So what I want to do first, uh, we've got that down, but I wanted to point out that there are two terms for height in here, okay? You've got a total wall height and a maximum height. The maximum height is dealing with what the bracing up to the header is. And the total wall height includes what we would call a cripple wall, but they call a pony wall. Did anybody ever grow up calling that a pony wall? I mean, what is this, some kind of dude from a ranch in Arizona? That's what they call it, it's a pony wall. It's Chicago, guys. You know, you're, you're doomed, you know, you're doomed. 
<laughs> if you join this organization, you're going to have to straighten them out. <laughs> That's right, but typically we call it a cripple wall, okay? But that total wall height is going to affect how you look at straps and stuff like that, things like that. There's other places, so you're going to need to know that information, what the total, because you, you're going to have limits on how high you can go up with the header, and then you're have, uh, how high, how high that you can go total wall height in order to do this method. So um, what we'll do is look at that information right here so that you can see it illustrated. The maximum wall height from the bottom of the plate up to the top of the header is 10 feet. If you ever see a house that that header is more than 10 feet, don't make the mistake of saying they can't do that. They can do it if it was designed. It's just that you can't use this method to evaluate it. Okay? Does that make sense? The reason I say that is because the IRC is a recipe book, book for most the most common construction methods that you're going to see out there. Chapter 3 of the IRC says that if any of your structure falls outside of the scope of what's in here, you're allowed to get that portion engineered. Okay, so you can do it. So don't assume that if somebody is greater than 10 feet that they're violating code. They just, you, but what I will do in that case, I'll say, hey, I noted that the header height is greater than what's in the IRC. Rec recommend confirming that this was done to an engineered design. And that's all you do. You don't accuse them of that they've not done it. And it's certainly capable. Nobody has a limit that they can't do something if it was designed. Okay, because sometimes we think that, like Mike was saying, this is the Bible, but it also has a little grace in there. You know, engineers can adopt some changes in there. If it's been done right, it's okay. It just says if you're going to use this method, that's your limit. Okay, so we all got that? Because I don't want to find out that some builder punched your lights out because you got in the face, all right? All right. And then there's total wall height. That's your. Maximum wall height plus your your what they call the pony wall. Why uh, the in the pony wall? Well, we're getting there. Oh. All right. <laughs> All right. So let's deal with everything one on one. It says that the header shall extend between the inside faces of the first full length outer stud of each panel. Okay. So that means that you got to go to there. Not there. <coughs> okay? Is that clear? Yes. Do I need to do that again or everybody get it? No, we can't. No, we can't. <laughs> here, not here. <laughs> so in other words, this header should have extended over to the to the king stud over here. And there's more detail that should have been done right here that we're gonna look at and see part of that why. But it's just stopping right here. It's not sturdy. The pivot point, there's a lot of force generated right here. And you didn't extend it all the way over. You'll see that in a minute. But that's the first thing that you got to see. So when you do that, it's all the way or stay home, baby. <laughs> yeah. So you can't stop it in between there either because that's your narrow wall panel. You're using that OSB to pick up the LDL there to tie everything together. Okay. <coughs> So this is what we're talking about here. Does that have to be an LBL or no, you can be on a header. It could be triple yeah, as long as it is going to support the load. But rarely you're not going to see these guys putting anything in but an LBL. So, so you see what I just did there? Can I do that again? See what's there? There's a top plate. We got we got our king stud, and then we got a jack stud, jack stud, and a jack stud. I'll pick it up this LVL here in general. We got to have a plate right there to support that. So that means that it's universally done, right? And that's a pretty big set of LVLs there. Um, I want to tell you guys something. I was I did a, a framing class for the home builders yesterday. And you may attest, you guys may attest to this, but I had a couple guys telling me, 
I keep telling my guys to do this and they won't do it. They tell me I've been building this for so long and they won't do it, you know, on a lot of this stuff. And so again, you're gonna find stuff out there. You got a comment, John? I was gonna say, I write that up probably once a week and they just get engineer letters say it's okay. They never fix it. And that's fine. Yeah, we're doing our job. But. We're doing our job. I mean again, I'm not a crusader out to punish people. I'm just here, just do your job. They, if never, they, they never have it up there. Yeah. So, but you know, our job's right up. So again, you will have things to, to put in your report that are legitimate issues. So what's wrong here? Well, there's no, no top plate. So you should start it right here at the jack stud. and should have gone all the way over there to the kings. You're not allowed to toenail into the top of LDL anyway. Don't you have to have a bottom plate and top, uh, top plate? Well, we're going to get there. <coughs> You're jumping ahead, Doug. Focus. Alex, you got some of your uh, ADD medication? <laughs> you need it right here, buddy. <laughs> That's right. You got some? Alex, what are you selling for? <laughs> Matter of fact, there's a detail on the side of this diagram right here. You see this right here? It's a cutaway view. Look what it says right there. It says to fasten the top plate to the header with two rows of 16D sinker nails at three inches. So that's what you're supposed to, you're actually supposed to nail that plate that's sitting on the jack studs up into the LVLs to anchor that in. You're trying to lock that whole thing in as a system. So if they put that as a detail, that again, this is all what gives it its design capability to allow you to have these narrow walls so you're, you're going to minimize your movement. I will say this, what's the typical worst case scenario that's going to happen? Well, the worst case scenario that it could fail and tip, rarely does that happen. But I will tell you what, I have, I've worked for a number of builders, and I don't know if you guys have done this on how many are doing it, but I had quite a nice little business working, doing quality control for a lot of builders. And that's really fun because, you know, there's nobody to yell at you. Because you're there working for the guy that's doing the work, you know. So, um, but one of the things I'll say is I had a guy, a couple guys that would tell me that when they use a stone or a brick veneer, that little bit of movement, because they didn't do the detailing, will cause cracking. And again, what happens, the perception of the buyer is, you built me a horrible home, um, you know, I really don't like me doing it. And a lot of these guys are building real high-end homes, too, so they don't want them to screw up. You know, very rarely am I finding people that want to build a bad home. So it's just that certain details, there's a reason for them being here because that was all the tested designs in here. So now you're going to ask me what's wrong with this picture? You get it now, right? Yeah. But what's really funny about this is when you take that and do a close-up, it's like they, they missed the point completely, didn't they? <laughs> Unless they got 316D nails underneath that, right? <laughs> and know that you got short, short, it comes in short widths, right? And if you special order, you can get them in longer widths, too. <laughs> They're all over. I mean, again, we got tons of these out there. Um, another thing that you want to look at is, is that panel itself has a minimum length and you go to a table for that. So we're so used to hearing the term length from top to bottom, but in this case, they're going side to side because it was engineers. Sorry, Mike. Uh -oh. <laughs> but uh, anyway, then they say engineers don't have sense of humor. So there's a table there, the minimum length for these panels for the side to side, and it's really going to be dependent on um, how high you're going up. Um, so let's look at that. So this is the table, and again, remember you've got to have the right one. People were going to the portal frame garage, but remember that's assuming a 3 8 inch, and that the minimum panel length was 24 inches, and we see them a lot less than that, so they were getting written up a lot, but that's not where we're at. We're here, remember? We're CSPF and the numbers are a lot lower. See, 16 inches is as low as you can go on those, okay? So 
what you look at when you have eight feet up to the top of the header you can have a 16 inch panel you get taller than that up to nine feet 18 inches and then 10 feet 20 inches 11 feet 22 and 12 feet now you're up to the minimum 24. the higher you go you're trying to maintain a six to one aspect ratio and what that means is, is that six times 16 is 96 or eight feet and so on. that's really where that's all coming from okay. header height only. huh header height. correct header height only correct and so slim builders i've changed the name of the builder i actually work for this builder but this gives you a, a panel length example of a non-example i should have said because you look at that area right there i'm measuring on the side there and I think it should have been 20 for the height of the header, but not even close, is it? Right? Okay, we get it, right? Everybody's quiet. Am I, have I lost you all, or are you just enthralled by this? <laughs> not our problem. Not our problem. How did he fix it? It was a sheet. Actually, I will tell you what she did is she got her engineers to sign off on it. And again, that's fine. You want to take the liability? Go for it. So we got our panel there. The panel, can it be spliced? No. Who is the, who is the, not, the person who is so rigid? Who said that? Is that Robert? You're not very... Your kids probably were always angry at you, weren't they? <laughs> yes, you can actually splice it. That same picture on the side actually shows you. If it's not, if it's an intermediate bracing, correct. If it is, if it is a On the edge. And I'm going to address that right here. Okay. So what we're going to look at is, is because of this scenario here, you are allowed to put a splice at the approximate midpoint of that panel height, but you are given a little latitude. You're allowed to do it within 24 inches on each side of the mid height. Okay. And it says if you need to do it, the edges shall occur and be attached to common blocking within 24 inches of the wall mid height. Notice how many they have in there. You got two blocks because you need a block for each panel to get your nail in because it's every three inches for this particular segment of wall bracing. So you always want to see two blocks. You'll see only one in there sometimes when they do splice it. Or they'll splice them down here or up here. Okay? You know, if they did that, the question is, is that how do you how are they locking them if they're vertical? You know, because if they're going side to side, they're locked by the side studs. But if you just stuffed them in there, I mean, I don't know, I mean, maybe you bolted them through. You know, but again, you're trying to anchor that together. This is just, again, you walk up to the house, it's got house wrap on it, but there's your splice. That's not mid-height, is it? Close. Close, but no cigar. It's not cool to splice below the header. Is that what you say to the guy? It's not cool, dude. <laughs> I can see Steve Johnson saying that, can't you? Yeah. Dude. And then look, I mean, you can still... That makes a good picture, doesn't it? And even though they've got it, you can still do it. You almost become good photographers doing this, you know? And then this guy made it real easy. He had plywood and OSB, so we knew that that was the wrong place to put a splice. So this detail right here is, again, a lot of energy is transferred at this point because you got this opening. You've cut a hole in the wall, and you've created an area where it might not be as stable. So with that stiffness, in order to keep it intact, you've got to do a nailing pattern right there. Okay? 
and the nailing pattern is minimum of 8D common or galvanized box nails and a 3 inch grid pattern. Okay, that's what you need to do minimally to make sure that this thing is really working as a system. So when you look up here behind the wrap, or you just run your fingers, you do the braille method of inspection, it ain't there. You know, a lot of times in that, that's what it should be like. Okay? And then sometimes you can get there before there and you just see it's not there, it's the omission. It ain't there at all. And then you got the Picasso where somebody puts a little piece in. Well, you didn't say you couldn't splice the mid thing on a vertical, right? No, but you still got to splice up here. And besides that, this thing probably isn't wide enough anyway. And then this is what I call the slob. You know, because we're a little bit over three inches, aren't we? It's like he was drunk. <laughs> you did that? All right, so the summary here is you got your scenario here, you put that in and you put your panel in there and you got to have this kind of nailing. You got to have double nailing. Three inch nailing. A lot of nails should be going in there. Yeah, it, it can, cause, but, but they're only using 18 nails too. And, and if you guys ever looked at the things, a lot of this comes from um, a design publication that that um, is, um, what is it? I can't remember the name of it right now because I'm thinking of other things. But anyway, there's a value for each nail. That's what it is. That's why there's more nails. Yes, sir? It might be helpful for some of the new guys to understand that after Katrina and Ivan, they did studies on all the houses where the hurricanes have ripped them apart. And they learned that the first thing to get compromised was the garage. Oh, yeah. Because the openings that we're talking about here would rack. And the lightweight garage doors would blow out. And all the wind would get into the garage and then take the rest of the house with it. Yeah. So this was the weak link in the chain, which is why there was so much focus in the new codes to beef it up. Yeah, you're right. There's a lot of great pictures out there of these failed yeah. garages in there and it just oh, leaned over. Also, uh, wind wall panels in there. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So we all clear on that? Are you bored now? You're yawning. You're yawning in my area, man. I'm going to call you out. Alright, I want to deal with something you can, this is the substitute for structural fiberboard. Structural fiberboard, we see, we've seen that, that blackboard that we saw for years. It's like a, a layered cardboard, and it does have a, 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 a strength value. So you'll see this uh, structural grade thermoplug. Only in pencil, not in compression. Correct. It's not for compression. Absolutely correct. What, what Don's saying is, is it'll buckle when it's pushed. So it's really just for being pulled apart. That's what it's for. Now, you'll see this stuff. A lot of you guys will see this because our energy code requires you to have um, what we call a, uh, a wind brace you know, up in an attic. If you put uh, bad insulation, you still got to coat it you know, to keep wind from blowing through insulation. So you'll see a lot of builders use this product is because it's real easy to install and it's real flexible and it's light. You know, easier than, than carrying panels of OSB up there and stuff like that. But it's actually based on a cardboard-based product with a, a, a plastic laminate on it. And it does have a design strength. My biggest problem with this is it's never really installed properly. That's the biggest problem. Um, this is a publication that will tell you about your nailing patterns and stuff. And you'll see different colors. That's the company, it used to be Ludlow, they were the company that manufactured it. Now it's Ox Engineered Products now. They probably got bought out during the, the bad times and stuff because we've seen this stuff for a long time. And you know how you can find it? It's actually on the sheathing. Okay, you'll see the website is on the, sh on the panels. So you can just go, and I was, you know, nice thing is with your phone, you can actually download the PDF 
the installation structures right there. So what you'll see here, a couple issues. Um, this is a garage wall. Um, I'm not going to name the builder, but John and I both have done a number of houses for this builder. This builder, I have, I have they're, they're my new bad builder around here. And, you know, I'm not going to say any, I'm not calling anybody out in this room, but this builder, you're going to see this a lot here. They just don't seem to do it right and don't seem to care that they didn't do it right. Um, but all we can do is protect our client. They've got a splice here. Okay. These lines are where you're supposed to put the staples. Theoretically, you're supposed to put them where they're at. You're not supposed to put them this way. You're supposed to put them this way so that they don't rip off the edges. So fastener placement, fastener spacing, staples are allowed because it's, it is picking up a, a thinner uh, member, so the, the staples are acceptable. But again, it's placement. Where's our grid pattern? Grid pattern's not there, is it? That's correct. You see what it says on here? This is uh, there's the website, and if you use the depending on the color, the, you, know, you got to pick the right color. This happened to be blue, so you're going to want to look at the blue information. They've got a technical evaluation report at OxEngineeringEngineerProducts.com. Again, you're going to see it when you're out in the field. Yeah, John. Uh, this is also used as a uh, house rack too. So they got tape it right as well. Yeah, I forgot about that. So it's supposed to be tape. Right. <laughs> yes. But that, I think that uh, they got a special way of uh, wall bracing and everything on the stud uh, before you uh, attach that. What do you mean? Uh, because it's, it has no, it has structural only intention, but it doesn't have wall bracing characteristics. So you got to build that into the wall before you put that. Well, not, you'd be surprised, not according to this. Um, essentially, wall bracing is a lot more tension stuff anyway. Um, but you go in there, and this is their tech evaluation report. That's our detail, isn't it? That's our detail. And you see stuff like um, you know, where the panel goes up there, panel width, all that information uh, is all in here and stuff like that. So. They are basically doing this evaluation report for CSPF, and that's what we're dealing with. So you can see that it's in there. Just to show you right here, they were supposed to have that three inch on center fastening there. It's all supposed to be all up in there, and again, it wasn't there in that picture. So again, just be aware of it. You're going to run across it, and. All you got to do is download this and then copy this and put it in your report because they should have done it, you know? Yeah, it's right here. I mean, you're pretty much putting it right there. Yeah, that information is in there, Don, though. They do give you the, the specs on that. All right. Uh, other issues with garages. Um, one of the things that we also want to talk about is we got our header right there. But what's missing? There's no plate across here, is there? And you're going to probably see this about 70% of the time. They will do this and say, what is the deal? Why do I need a plate? Now, we've got a double LVL here, right? Okay. And we got studs right in there. Any understanding why they might not, why this is supposed to have a plate there? The laminations. You're not cross the uh, lamination, right? That's one thing, and also the fact that it helps prevent bow, because yeah. you're going long distances right. and stuff. Okay, but there's no plate over the top of the LVLs. Okay, so let me just go back here. Let's see. Do I have a? Oh, see, is there a plate up there? Yep. Yeah, okay. Okay. So. So there's no plate over the LVL. The LVLs bow outward, and in this particular house I was doing, you can see how it bowed out. See how it drops out there. You know, you never quite capture, but it was it was worse. But the LVL was bowed there. I want to show you this, and again, some of you have been around a long time. Um, there is a wood eye joist manufacturers association. And you'll typically see this also in the 
um, in the and the bow is right here. That's your double LVL, and it bows outward. Okay, and this is the Wood Ice Manufacturers Association. And it's showing the drop because we call this a dropped header. Okay, and there's your cripples. And what they have, they've got that plate in there. They actually want you to fasten that uh, every eight inches, staggered. Okay, because this bowing action. If you do a little research, you're going to actually see three or four YouTube videos where these things they pushed them under load and they kicked out in a lap. So they were aware of this problem. It was, what it was doing was pushing brick walls out and stuff like that. So they were aware of this problem. Um, this came out, I'm guessing, what do you think, about 2005 or six. So it's been a, an issue for a long time. I think what happened is because the way the building industry just came to a standstill, one of the other problems, uh, you raised this issue, and I'm not trying to bring the conversation back, but <coughs> the other problem is, is we don't have a lot of people in construction anymore that have been building for a long time. There's a lot of new people. And a lot of the builders here who got trained and did well moved away or moved into other occupations when the building industry hit the skids. Well, the housing market's up and it's down. It's up and it's down. And those, yep. those people got to be Every, absolutely. I was one of those people too. I mean, I worked in there, same thing. But you're going to, from a builder standpoint, you, I'm sure you always deal with labor that skill levels will vary. Sometimes you, huh? Yeah, exactly. So, um, and one of the things that was funny yesterday to the builders, because one guy says, I don't know how I can do it. And one guy says, don't pay him. <laughs> But anyway, you can see that the whole industry addressed this and said, yes, we need the plate, and yes, it needs the proper fastening. So that's a backup for why it needs to be here. Again, you will write it up a lot. And again, we look at the picture, and there it is. It's right there. Okay. So what else is wrong? Hey, it's got to bear completely, doesn't it? The bottom of the studs have to have full bearing. So not only is there no plate up there, there's no bearing. And we can see it in all kinds of houses here. Remember? Studs you have to have full bearing on their bottom ends. Doesn't say it has to be to a sill plate. It's just they got to have full bearing on their bottom ends. Looks like it. Looks like a timber strand, actually. Some of you new guys, I don't know if you know, LVL is when it's veneers that are glued together. This is a variation. They've got strands. It's called timber strand. Typically, they'll span a little bit less than LVLs. But there's just different kinds of engineered products. Um, did you, so, Joe, you went down to uh, Trust Choice years ago. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember that. Have anybody gone out to Alabama and stuff? And don't they have an LVL plant around here, too? If you check with Weyerheiser, they'll let you go to the plant and, and they'll take care of you. You get to see how it's made. So if you're, if you're new, it's worth doing it. Alabama's the only place close to town. Is that the yeah. one? Are they just doing eye joists there or are they doing LVL too? I think they're doing eye joists there. When, they did, when I went to it, it was down around Wake Ross. Yeah, it was in Valdosta. Yeah, Valdosta. That's where I went because all they made was eye joists then. Yeah. So, but it's really quite helpful. They'll teach you how this stuff is supposed to be properly used and installed. Yep. They probably should have had another. Yeah, they could. They could have. You know, if you if you comply with code with two for your loads, there's no problem putting a spacer on that to pick that up. So there's a lot of ways it could have been done. I'm just really illustrating that sometimes it's more than just one by not putting that plate on there. And then again, you know, again, you just got this, you know, sometimes the, the cripples are too short, short too. So we go back to this issue again. Something else missing? Uh, I can't keep anything from you guys, huh? No straps here, are there? So back in uh, but that's not a continuous L, uh, still got to have them on the sides, Don. Don, don't be getting in like crazy, man. I didn't screw up. You are. 
Done? Don't be challenging me. I'll call you up, dude. So, well, that's where we're going to show you. We're going to look at that in here. But I wanted to point out that the ICC did not have a diagram. We, as a Georgia Amendment 2005, put a diagram in, but they universally said you had to have a strap on each side of that header to keep it from rolling in, and it had to be rated at 1,000 pounds. Didn't matter how wide the opening, how big the header, or anything. 1,000 pound strap on each side was the requirement. And that was, well, once they did testing, they realized that may not be sufficient. And so here's what we have today. So if you look at this drawing, this is a narrow wall. This over here, the wall continues. So this is what you were talking about, Don. So this is not a narrow wall. This is, that's why that's showing you. Notice how the strap placement depends on what you have. If you have a narrow wall, you got to go up here. Okay. If you go where you have a continuous wall, you only have to go to the top of the header there. Okay. Everybody see that? So yeah, again, this is what you'll see here, but again, the straps didn't go up, did they? And, and again, part of the problem is, is people just don't understand what they're for. All these things work together. Now this is where we use our total wall height because we include our pony wall because we're going up there and in this case we're strapping up above, up above that. So there's a table in that same section that actually addresses the tension straps. And we do it by the tension straps rated capacity in pounds. Okay? And Really easy to read table, okay? Um, you've got, well, first of all, we've got two by fours or two by sixes. So this is all two by fours, that's two by sixes. And then you've got these wind speed categories and exposure. Well, I'm gonna take some of the noise out. Let's get rid of those because we don't need these. We're only in a 90 mile, mile an hour here, okay? So really we're just dealing with two columns. Um, I know that you may not know this, but in chapter three, there is a, an exposure category for what our houses uh, are resting on, what they are exposed to wind. Most of us that are doing houses with other houses around are exposure B. That's almost pretty much universal here. You get into exposure C, then you've got like a, you're building right by a field with a big area where there's no trees or nothing, no hills to block wind. And when you get to exposure D, you're like sitting on a lake, okay? I'm not talking about on the ocean because that's another set of codes, but you're on a lake or something that's just no obstructed uh, wind. It's just coming full force at you. So most of us are in here, so you're gonna probably be dealing with this if you're dealing with subdivisions, okay? And again, the information that gives you these definitions is in the beginning of chapter three. It's in section 301, um, right before you get to 302. They give you all the definitions in there. Um, but you can see the scenario. If you've got a two by four wall with no pony wall at the top and your header goes up 10 feet and you're 18 feet wide, you only need a 1,000 rated strap, whether you're in B or C. That's what we were using for years. But more often than not, we're typically, we might be either here or here. We might have, um, you know, a wall that goes up, a pony wall that's two feet uh, or two feet and we're 10 feet to the header and then two feet pony wall. So now we're total wall of 12 feet, total height. And we're 18 feet. Look at, the, look at the rated capacity of that strap there. That's significant. That's almost four times what it was up here. So that's why the strap values change, because you can know one size fits off, okay? And so you can kind of see these numbers. And again, you know, you can see like this guy, this one's installed properly, he goes all the way up. The question is, how do you know that strap's right? Do you pull on it? Yeah. Do you, <laughs> you chew it like a quarter, is that real? No, what you do is, is you want to check it. There's usually a stamp on it. And again, I'm using Simpson because they're really good, but if, USP is the other company that you're going to see a lot of, and they all stamp their stuff in here. 
that sometimes USP is a little bit harder to see, but this is an LSTA, it's a, the T there for tension strap, and it's a 36, and guess what that means? It's 36 inches long. That's all that means, okay? Notice how it has an ESR report. That's for the ICC. Actually, Simpson's really good about stamping that on, so you can look that up and actually find that it was actually applicable for the IRC, okay? But then now we know what our strap is, so what we do is, is we go to LSTA36, and we go to the Simpson table, and we go here, and we know that it's inch and a quarter by 36. We have to fill all the holes, right? Or be a hole. And we've got 24 of them. And you can see, and I'm not going to get into this, but we're dealing with Douglas fir or southern pine or spruce pine for hem, or hem fir, they're both the same. Um, and we're going to be able to achieve 1,640 pounds of tension resistance with that strap. So if we got a 38, even two of them aren't going to work. Okay, we got to go up and beat. And the reason I say that is because I have had, and I'm not going to say this to the builder, but I say to them, ask your engineer, because sometimes they'll have the wrong size strap, it'll be undersized, their engineer will say, yes, you can put another one exactly next to it in the same configuration, and you will get that rated capacity for, the, for, for where you would sum the straps together. So if it's 1640, you put two together, it's 3280. So, but don't you say it, just say, hey, ask your engineer if you can do that. Because then it's just simply adding a strap. See how you can get around it without putting your foot in it? So does everybody see how to use this and how it applies? We all good? Okay. And then you can see some applications just really require some very heavy duty straps. And especially in this garage, I mean, you're, you probably have a very long area that these, look at the size of these uh, eye joists up here and, and the loading on there. So <laughs> that's why they're, they're uh, requiring it and the height. Again, that's the Y2, I already explained it. Um, and then just again, don't want, just want to remind you, don't forget about the fasteners, you gotta fill all the holes in there. Um, and again, we've already talked about the placement, okay? All right, before I move on, any questions about garage framing? Yes, sir. Acreage to the foundation. Uh, acreage to the foundation. Yes, it says that you're supposed to have two bolts with square washers, two by twos, that are tight, <laughs> and they're supposed to be in there. So a lot of times you guys will go in there, and they'll have so many studs in there that you can't put a fastener down there. That happens a lot. Or couldn't confirm fastening because of the studs. You can't see them. That's all you can do. Yes, sir? What about these large straps that they're using? Yes, when you see that, those are hold downs. If somebody has put a hold down, don't question it. They're way better than two bolts. Uh, I know some builders just put them in because of the conditions there. If they've gone that far to put a hold down there, it ain't going anywhere. And again, some of the reasons you have to remember, we are thinking about pushing, but it can go this way too. So it's holding that, that plate down so that thing doesn't tip. So if they've got that hardware, I mean, where I live, we've got all that because of the high wind. My house was designed for 140 mile an hour. So I got metal like crazy in that house and I've got those all over. And it, it, I was, I, we had a category two, we had Matthew came through and I lost a couple trees and that house is fine. So it did its job. What kind of exterior finish system do you have? I don't have an exterior finish system, that's Eves. I have siding. <laughs> I'm messing with you. I want to stay focused here, Dad. All right, so let's talk about floors. Okay, so floor systems, just some basic information. You're going to see two ways to express span. And the IRC span is expressed from bearing point to bearing point, the un 
supported area of the, sp of the span is what we call span. The reason I say this is because if you look at the deck amendment, they do it from mid-bearing point to mid-bearing point. There's two ways of calculating it, and so they're the spans are different. That's one of the reasons why you have to be careful of, of correlating the two. They're just different ways of calculating it. But um, the point is, is that's what we mean by that. The other thing is, is that we have two span tables for floor frame. It's based on the live loads, okay? As people in furniture. We have one table that's designed for a 30 pound live load. Where is that application going to occur in a home? Bedrooms. Bedrooms and? You yawning now too? Okay. Is it that bad? <laughs> Where's the next from? You got bedrooms are definitely where you have 30 pound live load requirement. In other words, you have to design your spans you have to use a 30 pound table for that spans if, uh, in a bedroom, okay? Or you can use it, I should say. Because you can use a 40 pound for a bedroom too, but where's the other place in the house? No, that's 40 pound. Yeah. <laughs> Bathroom, no? Attic. attic, what kind of attic? Storage. Storage. Ad, okay, that's it. Sleeping areas and attics that are accessed by fixed stairways. Not pull down stairs, but actual fixed stairways with the idea that at some point in the future, somebody's going to finish that, at least to make a better amount of it. So you can't just put ceiling joists there. You have to beef them up for the floor load. Okay, so that's where that is. So if you go into a house and they have fixed stairs, I mean, I used to do it a lot of times, a lot of these in town houses. They have the fixed stairs go up there, and if they're designed for ceiling joists, write them up. Because ceiling joists can span further because there's less loading on them. They're usually just, they're either just picking up the sheetrock of the ceiling, or they might, the difference is, is, is it an attic storage area or not storage area, but they're less than that, they're maximum of a 20 pound load. So you gotta add 10 more pounds of design, which shortens the spans of the same lumber. Okay, and then second thing is is that you got a 40 pound live load table, okay, and that's all other floors. Can you put 40 pound live load in a bedroom? Absolutely, you can make it stronger, but you know you're allowed to you know span greater distances with it. Um, everybody knows what the Georgia amendments are in January 1st, 2015. Golly, that just seems like you know six months ago. The changes in there were the span tables, and they only affected Southern Pine. Southern Pine, in a real quick couple sentence statement, when they started doing testing on Southern Pine, they realized that 40% of the Southern Pine was failing at full span, so they recalculated, and they ended up coming up with new span tables. Okay, so these new span tables. Now, here's, here's a 40-pound live load table for floor joists. Um, Real quickly, you got a dead load of 10 and dead load 20. What's the difference? 10 is the difference. You're a funny cat. Uh, I, I had that coming. It was a very imprecise question, so you gave me an imprecise answer. Okay. So, why would I use this category instead of this category? Chicago, you got in that too? Man, you guys are a tough crowd. What? The flooring. Yes, the flooring you're using. This would apply to most hardwood floors and carpet. This is going to when you start putting tile on. Okay, you start loading that floor down, it's going to deflect and bend more. So as a result, you might crack that tile. So you notice that we have a deflection criteria of the length divided by 360. So you start adding more weight on that, you've got to shorten the span. Okay? So a southern pine that was 14 feet here now can only go 1210 here when you add 10 more pounds of dead load or construction material weight, okay? So these are living areas and I just wanted to show you what they were. So this is the changes. So we used to see up to 16 feet one inch for Southern Pine, number two, at 16 on center. Now you can only go 14. So it, 
reduced significantly out there. And I probably, you're not seeing as much lump, uh, lumber construction for floor. Most people are, you guys use iJoyce and open web process, that's usually what's a lot easier to use anymore. Um, and then they have one, the, the sleeping area, and just, just to show you the differences there, because you can span greater distances, you could at one time go 18 feet in a bedroom. Now you can only go 15 feet. Okay, for that 